Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm John Boylan, and I coordinate the Studio 99 project that includes this discussion series along with the art projects that we run in the uh, space in the atrium and a visiting artist uh, program. Today we have as our speaker uh, Michael Goff, uh, who joined uh, Microsoft in February of, of this year as the Corporate Vice President of Design for the Applications and Services Group. I won't go into his whole bio except to say that prior to coming to Microsoft, he was Vice President of Experience Design at Adobe Systems <laughs> leading its multidisciplinary experience creation organization. Uh, today, he is here to talk about uh, visual literacy and drawing. So uh, I will uh, say no more. Michael, thank you. Excellent. Thanks, John. You should wait and do oh. that after the talk. Uh, one detail. Okay. I forgot to mention, the, uh, the, uh, for people listening online, the uh, comment question button has been clicked. So <laughs> if, they want to, if they want to comment or question, uh, they will be able to. Oh, fantastic. That'll be good. Uh, so as John said, uh, my previous role uh, was the head of design at Adobe. And uh, this talk uh, was actually created uh, when I had that role. Um, and so as a little bit of background, I want to talk about uh, where this comes from. Uh, Adobe is uh, not unusual in uh, software companies in that they're always trying to figure out how to make more money. Um, it's something about companies. I don't know what it is, but they just seem to think money is important. And Adobe, over the years, had figured out that there wasn't much money in creatives uh, because you know they're all broke. Uh, and so they wanted to be an enterprise company in the worst possible way. Uh, and then they wanted to be a developer company. And they just they kept wanting to be something. Uh, and about four years ago, uh, all hell broke loose uh, in the popular press and the trade journals and corporations. Everybody was talking about design. Like design was the key to, well, making all that money. Uh, and so company after company started investing heavily uh, in their design organizations. And people started talking about being design-led. And uh, it became clear to Adobe and uh, some uh, I, I may have helped with this a little bit, uh, that design was actually a legitimate uh, uh, business. Creative Creatives were, were actually a, a, a legitimate customer. In other words, they had money now. Um, and so we set out on this journey to essentially reposition Adobe uh, as the creative company, uh, taking a lot of uh, cues from companies like Nike uh, that figured out, well, if you just convince everybody uh, that they're an athlete, then you can sell them stuff. Uh, and the same thing was true at Adobe. Convince everybody they're creative, and this is the creative company, and so you would just want to be a part of uh, their world. While that was going on, we were creating the Creative Cloud. Um, and it turns out it's a great business study, and it gets tons of attention, and they're making lots of money. Um, but for me, one of the most interesting points was, what, what does it mean to be creative? Like, when are we creative? And I had this one observation uh, that led to this talk, which is, I don't know what creativity is. I don't know how it happens. But I do know nobody does it in uh, Adobe's tools. You don't open Photoshop and get creative. Uh, in fact, I had a team of 130-something creatives. And they always dropped the mouse and the keyboard and started drawing. Um, and so creativity was happening on pieces of paper uh, with pencils and pens. And so I set out to try to figure out why. And that's sort of what this talk is about. So I want to start with uh, the creativity question. Uh, or it turns out, for years and years, we have been able to pretty successfully divide people into creative and non-creative. Um, some of the reasons for, the, for that are pretty pernicious, but some of them make total sense. Uh, and uh, later in the talk, I'll talk about it a little bit more. Um, but most people uh, find themselves identifying with either the left column or the right column. Uh, there are always some overlaps. And yeah, any time you generalize about people, you get into trouble. But again, getting in trouble, generally speaking, you're either, uh, most of you are either emotionally uh, attached to things or you're logically attached to things. You tend to focus on either the big picture or the detail. 
uh, you uh, think mostly from your imagination or you focus mostly on facts. There are plenty of gray areas in between that, but there are these uh, general differences. And it used to be that uh, the way we thought about that is the left side of the brain was responsible for one part and the right side of the brain was responsible for the other part. And we know that's not true. Um, but we also know it doesn't seem to matter. People still act like that. So even though it's not a functional representation of the brain, it's a pretty useful representation of the way people think. So it turns out that people who run companies um, and people who do major engineering efforts and uh, a lot of people in uh, things like politics uh, love deductive and analytical thinking. It's just comforting. That idea that you know what the answer is is just awesome. Right? We, we, we cooked the, the numbers. We put together the spreadsheet. We had a bunch of statistics. We know what the answer is. It gives you a sense of control. Um, it turns out that that sense of control is not real, um, but it's still useful. And then uh, taking it one step further, I love what Albert Einstein said. We can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. Is everybody here a, a Microsoft employee? Is that how it works? Or Occasionally, almost everybody? Yeah. So if somebody sneaks in every once in a while, but by and large, you're all Microsoft people. So over the past, I don't know, 25, 30 years, uh, being rigorously logical, uh, being intensely focused on uh, quantities more than qualities has made this one of the biggest and most successful companies in the world, which is awesome. Um, it, there, there's an interesting question as to whether or not uh, that will continue to be true. So it's not like we created a pile of problems. We actually created a bunch of wonderful solutions. It's just will we create the next, general, uh, the next uh, wave of solutions using the same uh, mode of thinking? I would argue no, um, but I'll argue about that some other time. Uh, so <laughs> anyway, uh, it's not like uh, being creative or uh, creativity in general uh, is the only way to tackle uh, sort of the next generation of problems. Uh, but it turns out it used to be not, not a way at all. Uh, and creativity was widely disregarded. It was seen as a low-level skill. Uh, it wasn't applied to most of the problems that we face. Uh, and that is changing. I alluded to that earlier. You know, when you have uh, the Harvard Business Review writing their, entitled, their, uh, their latest version of their journal all about uh, design thinking, uh, if you have you know, people writing book after book uh, focused on this, then you know that the tide is changing. Um, and I don't know if I'm supposed to talk about this, um, but I'm kind of famous for talking about things I'm not supposed to talk of. Last week, um, and uh, yeah, whatever, I, I, I can talk about it. Uh, last week, uh, do you guys know about uh, uh, Harvard's um, uh, I mean, not Harvard. Uh, God, they're going to hate me for that. Stanford's D School. Hopefully, nobody's listening. Um, Stanford D School. Uh, IDEO created it. Uh, it's focused on teaching uh, creative strategies, uh, design strategies, to a much broader audience uh, than just designers. Uh, so they're taking non-flaky people and teaching them the <laughs> flaky skills. Uh, <laughs> speaking of non-flaky and flaky, they were here. D School was here uh, this past Thursday. Uh, I was able to uh, work with Satya uh, to basically take uh, his SLT, um, the leaders of this company, through design training. Um, I've been calling it sensitivity training. Like, I don't expect them <laughs> to be designers. Um, but I'm hoping they will understand uh, that the design perspective uh, is valuable and understand uh, why. So uh, it's a good segue to this. Uh, I honestly believe that everybody is creative, um, that it's not binary, that that list isn't totally true. Um, but there's a whole bunch of things that happen uh, during our life that uh, either make us distrust our own creativity or you know, block it completely. Um, and I have this little experiment that I've been doing, and it's actually been pretty, pretty effective. Uh, I can predict uh, when you stopped being creative. Um, and the way I predict it is just use the, there are uh, psychologists that have uh, very carefully organized the stages of development of drawing to the stages of psychological development. And so when you start with the scribbling phase, uh, which lasts till about age two, it's just kinesthetic activity. I mean, monkeys can do the same thing, right? You just 
it's actually quite wonderful. Um, I noticed you're kind of a doodler. So some of that is just that kinesthetic sense, right? Yeah, you just, oh yeah, I'm feeling great. Um, and so we all do this. There's a, a, you can take the most rigidly uh, logical person, and you're still going to see them every once in a while, just take their pencil and make a few uh, interesting shapes. Uh, in the next phase, these shapes start to have some meaning. Um, this is the pre-schematic pre phase. Uh, it's your first attempt to sort of uh, create forms. Uh, almost all people, uh, all, all, all human <laughs> drawings get past this phase, almost all. I've met at least one CEO um, that uh, I think stopped drawing about three. Um, in fact, I'm going to tell that story really quick. Uh, a couple years ago, I uh, got on stage uh, to launch uh, Adobe's uh, first foray into hardware. It was a pen and a ruler, a digital pen and a digital ruler. And I was on stage with, uh, actually, he's not a CEO. He's only a GM, uh, David Rwani, the GM. And uh, I asked him to do a drawing because uh, we were showing off what this, you know, these new tools are going to be like and what they're going to enable. And he did a circle, two eyes, you know, and like uh, these antennas, which I think were supposed to be the arms, but he just didn't know where they went. I mean, he basically <laughs> drew at exactly this level. And afterwards backstage, and this was long before I, I got this talk together, I was asking him, I said, like, did you just not draw as a kid? And so he grew up in India. He grew up with uh, parents who were, had decided he was going to be an engineer from like the time he was three. Like, so all of these other pursuits, he was just not supposed to do that stuff. Like no crayons. Get over it. Um, now, most people get a little farther than David did. Uh, so this is the phase after the pre-schematic phase, schematic, six years old. Uh, you're starting to actually portray your knowledge of the world. Or uh, what I like to say is you're starting to learn more about the world uh, while you're, uh, you're drawing. And you make these like a wonderful, complete landscapes. Uh, actually, most of us get through this phase as well. And about this time, around uh, six years old, if you asked any classroom uh, of kids around this age if they were creative, they would all raise their hands. So at this point, we're pretty secure that we have an entire population of creative people. Uh, the next phase, uh, we start to bring in more complexity. We're starting to draw more realistically. It's about eight, about eight to 10 years old. Things are still kind of going OK. A couple of people have self-selected or been selected by their overbearing parents to be, uh, I don't know, athletes. You know, the, the, uh, the next quarterback or batter. A couple of other kids have started to feel a little uncomfortable because you're feeling just a touch of peer pressure, but it's not too bad. And then this happens. You have been focused now. You're about eight to 10 years old. Uh, you're starting to draw your world realistically. You're trying to represent it. You're trying to understand it. And somebody says, nice sheep. Um, it's well-meaning, uh, but it was a cloud. And you're shattered. I mean, your parents or that, you know, uh, the, uh, your teacher, uh, their opinion is incredibly important to you. And they've made a critical error because there is this dissonance now between what you intended um, and what you accomplished and you're crushed, and you're right at that age where you're pretty sensitive about it, so you just stop drawing. And you will find tons of people stop drawing about this stage. And their drawings do look like those wonderful, the entire world is flat, you know, and the road goes up like this, and the house is flat, and it goes on top of it. They do stop there. Um, and this is like every executive in corporate America, um, <laughs> except for uh, my old boss, Mark Parker, who can draw like. Do you, do you guys know who he is? He's the uh, CEO of uh, Nike, um, and he was a shoe designer. And so I love telling his story uh, only because that was a designer who won. Um, and some designers do. So you, you get a little older. You get to a pseudo-naturalistic stage, about 12 years old. Um, you really are focused on the, product, the end product. It means a lot to you. The actual drawing as a thing that you can share with other people, that you can be proud of. Um, you're trying to figure out how to draw the world, so perspective comes into it, even pretty crappy two-point perspective. But uh, you're at least trying to get it right. Um, and that's when your art classes get canceled. Uh, so you had a good support <laughs> structure for this. Uh, you were making good progress. Um, and of course, they told you uh, it's uh, STEM, not STEAM. Uh, and uh, the art program doesn't fit into it. And you're done there. And you will see tons of people. Like Probably now we're at least half of well, this is, seems like it's probably a pretty creative group. You wouldn't be here, so you self-select for these skills. But if you took the average population of Microsoft people, probably about 50% of them 
could do a crude perspective, could start to think about you know, analyzing a drawing that way, uh, and then most of them would give it up. The next phase is super, super important um, in a lot of different ways. Uh, so this is the actual period of decision. You're deciding whether or not this drawing stuff means anything to you, whether creativity means anything to you. You're super, super uh, self-conscious about what you can or can't do. And this is the, the most pernicious, the most negative thing that we do in our schools right now. And I've told this to every school I've had an opportunity to talk with. Uh, we just tell people they're not talented enough. Now, picture this. Imagine that you were working on your, uh, you know, what, what it, where are we at, like seventh or eighth grade now? Your eighth grade essay. Um, you've spent weeks on it. The teacher looks over your shoulder, reads the first paragraphs, and says, I don't see any Kerouac in here. You should just give up writing. Um, we do this with drawing. We tell people, you don't have the talent, just stop. I mean, what we do is we cut people off from this, as I will try to explain in the rest of the talk, this incredible vital skill that supports creativity, that supports thinking. We would never do that with writing. We've come to understand how fundamental writing is to processing information, to communicating, and yet we take this other skill away. Um, so that's the point. You can definitely survive without knowing how to read. Um, but I mean, it helps, right? <laughs> I would argue the exact same thing. You can definitely survive uh, without drawing. But it's absolutely fundamental. Uh, to being creative, and it lo unlocks uh, a whole whole other parts of your brain. Brain. Um, so there's evidence that language. I'm not a scientist. Uh, that's probably obvious. Uh, <laughs> but when they did, when they got over the left brain, right brain thing, um, it was about the time they had MRIs. They could start really looking at what parts of your brain get activated by what activities. Um, activated by what activities? That's got to be right. Uh, and what they did find is that when you are making symbols, uh, when you're talking, or you're uh, uh, just communicating with basic symbols, you use one part of your brain. Uh, when you're actually drawing to try to make something, a shape, uh, a, an object, uh, you use a completely different part of your brain. And then the two parts of the brain, one is associated with logic, and the other is associated with emotion and uh, essentially creativity. So the link's there. I mean, it's just, it's, it's just science. Uh, so a lot of it is figuring out what we want to do with it. So that's my entire talk in one slide. Drawing might be the key that unlocks creativity. I probably said it three times so far, but I figured I'd put it up there just in case any of you weren't quite, or like if I didn't do my job right, or because we should blame me, right? It shouldn't be your fault if you didn't get it. Um, and this is pretty interesting. If you draw regularly, uh, I am absolutely convinced it'll change your brain. Uh, you will use parts of your brain you don't get to use very often. Um, and it will also train it, uh, so you'll use it more. So you got to draw. Um, and uh, towards the end, I won't just tell you go draw. I'll actually make some suggestions about how to approach it. Uh, there was something really interesting there that's gone. Uh, <laughs> Why was that? Oh, I know what it was. It's OK. Uh, we'll pass it. Uh, <laughs> So it turns out that uh, when people doodle, we're just going to make you officially the doodler. Uh, I mean, <laughs> there's probably others here, but I caught you. Um, it, it, it turns out when you start, and it might just be the kinesthetic sense, I don't know, but when you start uh, just making those random shapes or when you actually get more into drawing analytically, uh, you open up these other parts of your brain um, and uh, you think uh, more openly and creatively. This doesn't happen when you write. It's different. I don't know why. Um, there are some incredibly creative writers, and I want to take that away from them. Uh, it's a great uh, way to express creativity. Actually, uh, one thing that I should uh, try to make really clear is the ways that people who are creative express their ideas are not necessarily the same ways that they get them. Uh, and so when you see somebody that draws really well, and you kind of go, that must be how they're creative. No, 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 no. They're, they have the mechanisms for being creative, and they have mechanisms for presenting the creativity. So in general, writing is a mechanism for presenting creativity. Uh, and some people are better at being creative while they do it. Um, but by and large, uh, even they do they doodle. Uh, they handwrite. They do other things. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. Um, and this is this other thing that there might be a connection to is uh, you will find most people who draw 
um, and try to draw things that are representational, like they try to draw the world around them. Uh, it has to be quiet. Um, they, they struggle if they have to talk too much um, because, again, different parts of the brain are trying to work uh, and are working at cross purposes. Um, this is the first drawing that's actually mine. So. I put, tried to put image credits everywhere. Sometimes I couldn't find them anymore. That's one of the downsides of the internet, but it's just a cow. Um, so um, one of the interesting things about uh, drawing uh, is it's a way to represent things. Um, and so one of the ways we represent things, this is also a cow. Um, I think it's Wikipedia. Um, cows are big, blocky creatures that come in a variety of color sizes and even shapes. <laughs> Most images that come to mind are, I mean, do you want to do, we can spend the rest of the talk, on, I can just read that. <laughs> um, but that's also a cow. Uh, both are useful. Like sometimes you need an incredibly technical description of something, you need a lot of detail, and uh, writing's pretty good at that. Um, one of the things that's really wonderful about drawing is it's a lot easier to get to a, a common understanding uh, quicker. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, what happens is you engage other parts of your brain when you're looking at it. Uh, and so uh, you learn more about it faster. Uh, and so uh, I think I may have mentioned earlier that I've been doing this talk uh, to a lot of schools. Um, it's gone much better than my talk about uh, copying. Uh, I did the total aside, but uh, for about a year, uh, I would go from school to school uh, and also work with Adobe's um, Education Leaders, which is an, an, an organization of like two or 300 educators throughout the country that uh, they stay connected with so they can sell them stuff. Um, but uh, this, uh, so the, the talk that I gave them was about uh, why copying is so important to early development and all that and all their bullshit about not copying people and uh, ruined my chances of uh, having strong designers because designers' most important skill is seeing the world around them, understanding it, essentially copying it, and then making it better. Um, another talk. Uh, but when I, I was talking to them, I, I was trying to explain that drawing is fundamental, or could be fundamental to learning. Um, so you don't need to teach people to draw. You need to have them draw, because uh, it'll help them uh, learn. Um, they, one of the uh, things that uh, they have found about this is there's this in school, they take drawing pads and they cut them in half, uh, or writing pads, and they force force uh, children. Uh, they encourage children to draw uh, before they write. Uh, when they do it, uh, when they do that activity, it's, and it's not about who self-selects to draw and who doesn't, but if you uh, have people draw before they write, uh, the writing's better. It's richer. It's more complete. Um, it's uh, more visual. Um, and so again, the same point being made again and again and again until I bore you with it. Uh, but there's this huge connection and advantage. Uh, but one of the downsides of it that we have to address is uh, most people, and this was uh, a, a college professor who teaches a math class that requires drawing. And she said that people loved the math. That, that part was easy. It was that drawing part that just destroyed them. Um, which again might come from uh, you know, these early things, these early uh, like social pressures. Uh, this point where somebody convinced us that we couldn't draw. Um, and then doodling. Uh, this is, uh, uh, Sunny gave a talk at TED. I've been kind of addicted to TED for years. It's still one of my uh, guilty pressures. More guilty now than ever, because they're kind of a sham organization. I probably shouldn't say that if this is going to be recorded. But um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> some TED talks are really, really good. Sunny's was really good. And she was just talking about uh, the relationship between doodling uh, and thinking and how valuable it is. Um, so let's talk about why we draw. Because um, there's a lot of different kinds of drawings and a lot of different purposes for it. Uh, one of them, and this is one of my favorite ones, is just to explore. Uh, to give uh, shape uh, to your ideas. Um, one of the things that's really nice about drawing is when you give, you externalize the idea. Uh, you can look at it and evaluate. It fires other ideas. Um, but also when you externalize it, you can share it with other people. Right? So the drawing now is... Uh, a, a great way to collaborate. I, um, I have a slide in another talk somewhere that has a whole boardroom full of people, um, you know, just everybody in a suit, old school, Mad Men style. Um, and what happens is they get in a room and they talk for hours. And then maybe somebody comes up and does a PowerPoint presentation with 400 things that they should do together. Um, and all along, what they're working on is getting to some common view, some sort of agreement. And I found it really, really fascinating because in those environments, and we're all in those environments every day, meetings, 
uh, we do work really hard using language to come to some common agreement about this thing that we're going to make or do. And I promise you, if it's only language, every time you go out the door, you're as disconnected as you were when you went in. <laughs> Um, because if you don't visualize it, if you don't make it real in some way, it's so easy uh, for everybody to have their own interpretation of the words. It's still sort of true of drawing, um, but it's why design is so powerful right now, because most designers draw. Um, it's not as powerful as code, by the way, so for any of you that are developers. I think you should just friggin' code it and show it. Um, we're going to get to the point where you should be able to code almost as fast as you draw, at least for experiences that people uh, touch and interact with. Um, but the whole point is, when it's a thing, when it's real, you know, when you can get your brain all around it, it's a lot easier uh, to get on the same page. Um, and it should be easier to convince all those guys in those suits in those boardrooms, right? Uh, if it's a competition between a PowerPoint deck with slide after slide of statistics and some drawings of a thing, um, the drawings of the thing should win. Um, they haven't historically, but I don't know if you've noticed that I've been in meetings. So I've been here for six months now, um, and I've been in meeting after meeting, and almost without exception, the product is talked about, and the statistics are shared, and the thing itself is never shown. Um, I was giving Satya a really hard time about that. They have a PLT, Product, product Leadership uh, meeting, and sometimes they don't look at the product. Um, God, I'm getting in more and more trouble as this talk goes on. Yeah, <laughs> I unchecked that box. There's some boxes about whether or not you share the talks, and I checked both, and maybe I should go back. <laughs> so the, the point is, it's really, really hard to think about things uh, that are just stuck in your head. It's also really, really hard to just fool yourself. So you make it external, um, and it'll help. Uh, so um, this is Milton Glaser, basically, on the same topic. Uh, it's uh, ideation, ideation drawing, just bringing something out into the world, seeing around it making things happen. Another reason we draw is to perceive. Um, this is a great thing to do. Not everybody's going to have the time. Like, everybody should meditate, how many people actually do. Um, it's just such a pain in the ass. Um, th this sort of drawing is almost the exact same thing. Uh, it's definitely for the benefit of the person drawing. Uh, you observe the world, you record it. Um, the thing that's amazing about it is you observe the world completely differently than you would if you're just walking by it. Uh, I, as an experiment, some number of years ago, because my son was about this tall, and he's this tall now, uh, we were traveling through Europe. And uh, once a day for one hour, we both sat down and drew the same thing. Um, and it was remarkable, because I don't remember that trip at all, but I remember everything I drew. Um, and I remember it in great detail. Uh, and th uh, Theo seems to do the same. Uh, by the way, uh, he's studying to be a designer. It's probably because of that trip. <laughs> so drawing as discovery. Uh, this is John Berger. Uh, he knows a crap load more about this. If you can get him to talk about uh, drawing, it would be better than me talking about it. Um, but it's a way to force yourself uh, to really look at the object, look at it in detail, really understand it. Um, and it's a pretty wonderful experience um, and probably easier than meditation. Um, let's go past that. So this is the third reason we draw. And this is why we draw uh, in corporate settings. It's to communicate. Uh, to share ideas. Um, there are some great conventions that have been created around drawing. So I was an architect formerly. There are symbols that architects use. That's not really a door. That door swing is just a symbol for a door. But everybody looks at it. Everybody knows that's a door. Same thing with windows, things like that. Uh, we're doing that now with UI. There are drawing conventions for UI, especially uh, when you're just doing wireframing and things like that. And again. The reason you do it is it makes that thought more precise. And I already said that, so I won't say it again. Uh, when we don't draw, um, it turns out everybody has a different image in their head. Uh, and we can get, we think we're on, on the same page, uh, but we're not. Uh, drawing, architecture drawing, uh, this was the architecture practice that uh, I was a part of 20 years ago, 25 years ago, uh, with uh, my partner, Wes Jones. Um, so the other reason, this is the other reason we draw. We draw to realize things. Um, so that more and more, uh, when we're drawing uh, in this context, uh, when we're drawing UI, uh, we're actually drawing the plans uh, so something can get built. Uh, in architecture, we've been doing it for a long time. So it's the bridge between the imagination and the actual thing. You try to draw it in great detail so that people will know exactly how to build it. Um, and that works pretty well. And then this is just an important point. Uh, 
everybody knows who Ken Robinson is, right? Sir Ken Robinson? Yeah. He talks a lot about similar topics, about the importance of creativity and how it's being uh, you know, basically beat out of uh, children. Um, bad way to express it, but uh, the, this whole idea of trying to get uh, creativity back into uh, education again. Um, but one of the, the key things about uh, firing your imagination and then making your imagination useful is making that transition from where it's locked in your head uh, and out there in the world. Oh, and that, this, these hands. Uh, this is Adrian Newey. Um, any Formula One fans? Um, so Adrian Newey was, uh, and is back now, the aerodynamicist for um, Red Bull, uh, which for a number of years, and this talk was better one that was true, uh, was the most successful uh, Formula One team. Uh, and they may only not be successful because Adrian left for a while. Uh, but he uh, draws uh, like this uh, with a pen uh, and a ruler and protractors. He draws by hand. Everybody else is using the most high-end, sophisticated computers to uh, model these things. And he's drawing like this and, again, is considered uh, the best aerodynamicist in the world. He's working on America's Cup campaign, too, right now. And the way he explains it is he, he has to because he can feel the answers. Um, and it'll be interesting. Um, the only reason this is here is uh, I know uh, Panos and the team at Surface already know this. They're trying to figure out how do we get physical objects uh, back into computing. There are spatial and kinesthetic uh, senses that we're, are going to come back into play. And I think we're going to be able to think better. Um, and then the other reason we draw, and this is the what most people think of uh, with drawing, is it's like art. It's to express yourself. And I put this in here um, because this is a talk about the value of drawing. Uh, this is a Raphael, and it sold for $47.8 million. So drawing's valuable. Um, there's other reasons it's valuable. That's a pretty good reason. None of my drawings have gone for $47.8 uh, million. So um, uh, last uh, part of the talk, um, this is uh, why you can draw um, and, uh, well, how you should go about it. Uh, a lot of people say uh, they can't draw. In fact, most people say they can't draw. and I. Um, at my last job, uh, I took on drawing as one of my like, own initiatives. I had a team to run, but I, I still like to design software. Um, and so we did a combination hardware and software uh, project to basically create uh, drawing applications uh, for the iPad. And every single person that joined that team said, but I can't draw. Um, and within a few weeks, they were showing me their drawings. And they were super, super proud. And the, the point was our tools were just awesome. No, the point was um, it doesn't take much. Uh, about the easiest way to draw, to learn to draw is to well to draw. Um, it's just not that hard. Uh, everybody actually can draw a line. It's just if you artificially make that uh, have some idea of what that line should be, and it's not what your hand does, uh, then you'll get frustrated. Uh, and it's the same thing. Like uh, back, you know, the Kerouac example. If you think you're going to write like Kerouac, um, you're either brilliant or um, wrong. Uh, and so don't try. Uh, you should learn to draw like you. Because um, we all have our own personal expressive uh, qualities. We all have, and at the very essence, we all have our own line. Um, everybody draws a line in a slightly different way. You can be trained to draw a straighter line. Like you will learn that if you pivot from the elbow, you actually make a curve. Uh, it's just natural. So people who are constantly trying to get rigider and rigider, trying to make a straight line and get more and more frustrated, uh, they're still going to make a curve. Um, so you move your whole hand. But you don't have to. I mean, those curves could be wonderful. There are whole artists who've made their whole career on, they always draw curves. Um, and everything, their whole world, and maybe it's their eyes, but their whole world's curved. So just embrace the hand you have. Don't worry about it. Um, all good drawing means is that it supports your way of thinking. Um, so you're already good at drawing. You just don't friggin' know it. Um, and then you say, well, it doesn't look like what you see. Um, and there are a bunch of techniques. Uh, for making drawing look like what you actually see. Uh, and they're valuable if you want to do representational drawing, and it'd be fun to take classes in that. Uh, uh, but it's not interesting. Uh, everybody has an inner critic. Um, uh, and just tell that critic to shut up. Um, you have to figure out a way to do that. Uh, it's, uh, it, I don't know why the inner critic for creativity is so much uh, more aggressive than your inner critic in other areas. You know, the ones that are telling you, the one that was telling me not to say the things I said, I just glanced right over it. Uh, uh, <laughs> but somehow, the one that tells you, look, you're not creative, uh, it just has such a hold on people. Um, that 
the inner critic really doesn't know anything about drawing, because you don't know anything about drawing, and you actually are that inner critic. So it's pretty obvious. Right? So when it's saying you don't know how to draw, just tell it, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, it's pretty easy. Um, and then you say, I'm not an artist. And it's just really important to understand that's not the point. Um, some people are artists, and uh, God bless them. I'm glad they're in the world. Uh, they make it richer. You don't have to be an artist uh, to draw. Um, and it's not about talent. Um, there are some people, it's scientifically proven, like everything else in my talk, um, there are some people who are just amazing uh, draughtsmen, uh, draughtswomen, draughts people, uh, that you just like come out of the womb and you draw. Uh, there's somehow amazing perceptual uh, connection. It, you see it, you perceive it, you draw it. Oh, that was actually the slide that was missing. Eidetic memories? Um, you know, the, uh, the percentages are, I keep reading different studies, but I think it's up to 15% of all children up to the age of three basically have photographic memories. Um, and then it drops down precipitously till there's, you know, really weird adults. By the way, my dad was one of them. Different story for a different time, maybe over beers. He would draw dollar bills um, just flat out. He could draw well, any denomination. He could probably draw anything, but dollar bills are a good thing to say at a bar if you want to make a $20 bet. Um, and so he would just start drawing the whole dollar bill till they gave him the 20 bucks because um, he had it uh, in his head. He was a freak, but um, <laughs> he could do that. So it, it, in this case, it's not really about talent. It's about the patience and the practice, right? So we're not all going to be uh, the next great baseball player. Most people with a little bit of training can hit a ball. Um, and that's your goal. You're just trying to hit the ball. Uh, you're not trying to be, I was going to say Barry Bonds, but there's so many negative connotations now, I won't. Um, and you could say, look, you're just embarrassed, um, or you don't really see the point. You, know, you don't want people to see your drawing. This is a total aside for a different uh, talk, but remember the part where I said the decision? There's that time in your life where you're making that decision about whether you're creative or not. Uh, I have this uh, way of telling. You walk into a classroom, and everybody's drawing. The one that's drawing like this doesn't want you to see what they're doing. They're so creative. They haven't given up yet. Uh, and they're starting to develop all of the negative aspects of being creative. And one of them is you're never done, um, and you can't share. Um, and so they, most creatives are easily embarrassed. Um, the point is, for drawing, this is a selfish act. right? So far, you're not drawing because you're going to be the next great draughts person. Uh, you're not going to be an artist. Uh, you're just drawing for you. Uh, it, this is a, uh, something that you are doing because it's going to help you think better. Um, it's going to uh, help expand the creative uh, centers of your brain. And then you say it's complicated, it's time consuming, it's, i got too much to do. Um, I can't hardly get through this talk. Um, so the, here is actually the most valuable uh, information. Draw a little. Um, don't set out to do something big and major uh, like uh, draw. Do you do fashion? Yeah. yeah. So she already knows how to draw. That's cheating. Um, but just draw a little. Um, but do it often. Uh, you know, in those little spaces when you're not quite paying attention to the meeting you're in, just draw anything. Um, you know, you could start with squares. Graduate to coffee cups. Um, but uh, do it on a regular basis. Simple things so you don't really care about what the conclusion is. Uh, I have two little things I appended to the uh, end of my talk. And the first one, um, these are like, things to think about or things I should be thinking about, but now I'm torturing you with them. Uh, the first is this weekend, uh, I'm going to a uh, gallery opening. Uh, and an artist named Pam Keeley is speaking there. Uh, she's a very talented uh, artist who draws. Um, that's her focus, her discipline. And she had some kind of major creative block some years ago um, and couldn't figure out what to do about it. Uh, so she's a kind of, maybe at the, this is the meta level. Uh, I'm trying to encourage you all to draw, to open up your creativity. She was drawing every day, and her creativity still got blocked. So she started drawing with both hands. Um, and I'm really, I, I would love to do like a whole, get her in the MRI, do a whole research project about that. I mean, because if you, the, the next stage in thinking about this, you know, drawing to unlock creativity and the kinesthetic sense and the parts of the brain is, like, what if you're doing, you're doing using the other hand to get back to the other part of the brain, and I just, I'm blown away by it. And her work is absolutely astounding. Um, I'm trying to get a, uh, 
more information you need, but I'm trying to get a Surface Hub to her this weekend so that she can draw uh, with both hands and everybody can watch. Um, but this is basically uh, one of her paintings, and it's, it, 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 it's like weaving when she draws. Both hands are just going like that. It means something I don't know what, so both hands. Um, and then the, uh, the last thing is uh, I, I took this new job. I probably already told you about that. Uh, I'm here now. Um, and uh, most of our customers don't draw. Now, maybe we should encourage them to, but I don't think it's going to be a quarter of our business. Uh, so uh, taking just a slight step back from that, um, really, really fascinated now with the relationship between typing and handwriting. There is a whole body of research that we retain better. Um, you can write. You can listen to this entire talk, type the whole thing, and not have heard a word. Um, which I think is a remarkable skill, but uh, court reporters have proved it uh, you know, for generations. They have no idea uh, what was going on, but they faithfully recorded every word. For some reason, typing, and maybe it's just the facility, like you can do such a better job of recording, you don't hear, you don't un or you don't understand. Um, and so when uh, you handwrite uh, your uh, notes, like in a class, uh, you retain more of the information, you process it, you actually act on it. Uh, if you read most people's notes, they're not verbatim what was said. It's actually what they thought of it, what it means. Um, and so I'm excited about that because we're making pretty major investments right now in uh, pen. Uh, and uh, if we start really focusing on handwriting as interface, uh, so not just as a tool for doodling or for recording, but actually the interface itself, I wonder if we're going to unlock uh, some of these other parts of the brain, help people be uh, a little bit more well-rounded, a little bit more uh, thoughtful. I just think there's an opportunity there. And maybe a, ho a whole nother talk. And if one of you want to get that talk together, uh, I'd be happy to uh, find you venues to give it. That's it. Thank you, Melvin. That was great. Do we have questions? We have, a little, we have some time. And, and again, online, if you, if you do, just put them on the uh, push the little button and, and write them, and I will moderate. So go I'm going to go back there first, and then you. he raised so, his hand quicker than me. That's okay. Uh, I want to know your thoughts about uh, art education in elementary schools. Yes. Uh, um, I, I, I don't draw much, but I get the sense that it's being taught uh, as badly as I teach math. Uh, that there is uh, just a lot of, big, it is used initially as a, um, uh, just a way to build motor control, and then nothing happens, and then it, then what you pointed out earlier that they come to a crisis point where criticism happens and they give up. Yes. So what are your thoughts on how, what are the best ways to fix or improve the situation? So the, the same caveat, not a scientist, I'm also not an education expert, but I love talking about it. Um, so it's like, you know, everybody has an opinion, that whole thing. Uh, I am really, really conflicted about the emerging uh, uh, STEAM effort, trying to bring the arts education back, only because, uh, first of all, you're absolutely right, it was taught as bad uh, or worse than math is taught in schools today, uh, with the same interesting challenges. Uh, in math, they teach procedures, um, methods, uh, they don't grow understanding. Um, and in art, I, I remember my kindergarten uh, art class, I made a clay um, what do you call it? Cigarette, where you put your cigarettes. What's that? Ashtray. Yes, I made a clay ashtray. Everybody in the class made a clay ashtray. Uh, what did I learn? I mean, absolutely nothing. Uh, teaching creativity makes total sense. And there's actually a whole body of work on how to teach creativity. Now, you might make something out of clay in the process of learning to be creative. So I, th I do think we need creative as a part of our education. One of the tough parts is you can't separate it. Uh, it it's not creativity applied to, well, I don't, I don't know, art itself. It should be cut across uh, all the disciplines. Uh, the uh, professor uh, that had that one slide on has been teaching drawing to, in math classes for a long, long time um, because there's a lot of spatial concepts and a lot of relationships. And she just finds that when you use drawing, uh, it unlocks those. Uh, so that's one place where drawing and also creativity uh, could apply. So my, my short answer is totally agree. Both are taught incredibly badly. Uh, believe that both could be taught incredibly well. Um, and it hinges on stop calling it art, start calling it creativity. Um, uh, any, any suggestions on 
short term things that parents can do or um, Oh yeah, I, I can get you uh, resources and references. First of all, be super open-minded about what your children draw. Uh, get them all to draw. Uh, my biggest focus right now, um, I'm on the board of a school uh, down in the Bay Area, and it's about uh, uh, applied knowledge. As curious as it may sound, uh, there were tons more, uh, just I guess more a higher creative quotient in, the gen in, in my generation, the generation that grew up with a, a, a shop or a garage, like a place to make stuff, uh, when you're engaging positively with your world, you're making it what you want it to be, um, uh, pretty magical things happen. There's a lot of creative uh, learning that happens just in that. How old are your kids? Seven. Seven, yeah, they should be building stuff um, all the time. Uh, building stuff, drawing. It doesn't really take much more than that. And then uh, non-judgmental, that's pretty important too. It's your turn. Um, so I stalk you online a lot. And that's kind of awesome. Uh, you did that great interview about the digital pen when it first came out. Mm -hmm. And you said that that's your new favorite method of drawing, digital pen on glass. Yes. Do you feel that that stimulates the same part of your creativity in your brain as drawing on paper? Uh, yes and no. So first of all, we've got a long ways to go to unlock some of the stronger uh, tactile aspects of drawing uh, on glass. Uh, there, the reason that it became, uh, that, that I got addicted to it, uh, there was twofold. First of all, there was something super, super liberating about not worrying uh, about the commitment that you just made to a sheet of paper. I mean, it was just freeing. I started drawing a lot more um, because I didn't have to. You get to the point, uh, for those of you that have notebooks, at first it's pretty open and wonderful. If you get about six years of notebooks in, you remember that you keep going back and you look at the old ones um, and you go, oh, my god, that's embarrassing. Why did I draw that? And so it, it, as the body of work gets greater, and this can happen just within one book, uh, the level of commitment gets higher and higher. And the digital stuff, you know, it's uh, we had a three finger unwind. So you could just unwind your drawing and then start again, you know, or you could fast forward again. So almost, the, I guess the lack of commitment was really freeing. Uh, so that was awesome. Um, there was also, uh, there's a bunch of flexibility in digital tools. Uh, it, this is less about commitment and more about resources. Like having all of my paraphernalia uh, around me was hard. Um, so in that regard, um, it was it, it was it was equally uh, freeing. Um, now to fast forward today, I've kind of gone back to notebooks, uh, and uh, part of it is uh, can't get my damn surface to work. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I've been struggling a little bit, and uh, some of the tools uh, aren't a as strong. Um, so I haven't been carrying an iPad around to meetings, although I did carry a, a Mac today to this one. Um, but I think work close. And it, for anybody who's been and seen the latest uh, pen work uh, that the uh, Surface team is doing, uh, it's getting so good that it really is getting to that point where what you meant is actually what gets drawn on the screen. And so in that regard, it will continue to be uh, my favorite. Yes? Just to address the question about arts education, especially in kids, there's, <clears throat> there's a lot of initiatives happening now where teaching artists come into classes and work over a long term, not just once or twice, but maybe over a whole term, where the, the students might be dealing with social studies or math or history, and say, create comic book zines. So the kids all collect, collectively create their own zines about, say, the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Yeah. And it's not judged on how good the drawings are, it's just what kind of a cool zine were you able to make. Yep. And that's happening across the board. Uh, Seattle School, uh, Seattle City of Seattle, is working with the, with the school district to actually bring reintroduce arts ed, arts education into the schools. The goal is at least two hours a week in all schools over time, and a lot of that will be drawing and similar activities. So it's Excellent. happening across the board. It's just a re, uh, it takes I, some time. It takes time, but I think it's good. Yeah. Right. Go ahead. This is not a question, but a story. Uh, when I was about 13, I had a 300-page workbook in school, 
and I doodle all over it, every page, the whole thing, the whole term. And at the end of the school year, uh, the teacher said, I during May, this is a parent-teacher conference with my parents sitting there, she said but she was going to give me a B because uh, she had told me not to doodle. Yeah. <laughs> and she said she would give me an A if I erased them all. And I said I would not do so. Uh, and because I felt as I was doing all the doodles, I was listening, I was paying attention to what I was reading, and that's how I was absorbing it. And I, to this day, I, I'm glad I made that decision yeah. to take the B. I got very, very lucky uh, in, no, it wasn't sixth grade, it was seventh, Mr. Bean, um, because he noticed that I was drawing all the time, and I had been constantly told, you have to stop, you're not paying attention. Uh, and he figured out that no, I, it was the way I processed information. Part of it, it was my drawings were of the things in the, uh, in the class, the talk. Uh, it was just the way I recorded information. So I had kind of the exact opposite experience. Somebody unlocked that for me and pointed out to me how valuable that was. It's cool, you figured it out yourself. Um, but yeah, that teacher should be shot. <laughs> I have to confess that partly it just wasn't worth all the time of it. To do it. <laughs> so it wasn't a political statement. Okay. But I, I felt like I really was learning the material and the doodling wasn't preventing it, it was yeah. facilitating it. You're right. Yes? Um, I'm dating someone who's very, very analytical, but he's constantly asking me to give him sketching lessons because we want to work on things like apps and just get ideas out together. Yeah. And I'm stumped as to how to get him to stop being afraid of making marks on paper. And I don't know if you have some fun activities to throw at me to suggest. You know, um, I'm going to point you to somebody. Um, we can make the, uh, my, if anybody has any additional questions, I'm just mgoff at microsoft.com. Um, but I'm going to connect you with a kid named uh, Matthew Richmond. And he did all of the drawing classes uh, for Adobe when we were first getting this out here. Uh, he and his wife have these amazing uh, exercises. So we'll just make that personal connection and you'll have, you have a, a world-class uh, drawing teacher. Uh, Matthew will be really happy about that. Anyone else? Oh. Just maybe like a, a related question to work. It's like, as designers, I mean, I'm a designer in a team, uh, we often get to the... Uh, what we call experience reviews, so those are like, you know, critique with all the way up to our VPs, and they come in and they, you know, give their opinions, right? Uh, I'd rather have them give their analysis, but they give their opinion on what they are being presented. And yes. Often they want, like, high-fidelity stuff. And part of me is puzzled by, you know, where are they drawing those critique from? Because most of them don't draw or like more, you know. So where are those opinions coming from, and how can we make them more sensitive to what they're saying and, and you know, enable us to, you know, do a better job, you know, with the products we're presenting, not just like responding to opinions and say like, oh, I don't like pink, so, you, you know, you can't do that. Yep. You, you can't have pink or, you know, I'd rather have purple. Or, okay. How can we help them? Help so us? there's, there's, got, there's a whole talk there and my entire career and yours too, um, <laughs> that uh, idea of getting to people to understand uh, the impact of each uh, comment they made. So people in positions of authority uh, get there because they're good at making decisions. You know, they're the, the command and control thing. And so they apply that to the full range of things. They probably apply that to, you know, uh, picking airline seats or, you know, uh, bathroom stalls. And, but when they apply it to uh, design, um, and it turns out to a lot of other things that they don't have a full grasp of, um, they can do some serious damage if what they do is give you the impression that you have to listen to what they said to do and not what uh, it meant, what motivated it. Yeah. So we all have opinions. All our opinions are valid. Uh, that it's if you can get to what motivated the opinion, not what was the, like if they said uh, it can't be pink, um, that's What's a little reaction. Yeah, what, 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 what were they reacting to? Why were they reacting to that? Um, we, are, we want as designers to listen all the time, um, listen so hard that it basically changes our opinions about things. Um, but you have to listen not to what was said, but what was meant or what motivated it. So that's the, the most important thing. But then 
yeah, we can have a, a nine-year conversation about how to do that. I will tell you one other thing that I found works really well in a corporate environment, um, which is specific, I guess, to the pink. Uh, personal taste should be off the table. I am um, a little bit concerned. Uh, actually, I'll go ahead and, since I'm already in trouble, appalled. Uh, how many different visual styles there are at Microsoft. Everybody does their own. Um, so as a result, it is just personal opinion. Like it's that this team does whatever the hell way they want, this team does whatever the hell they want. Um, nobody's wrong because there is no right or wrong between pink and red, for instance. Um, but if it was always pink, uh, then red's wrong. Uh, and so you want to get to that point quickly. You want to get to a common vocabulary. And companies that do that, the Porsches of the world, like, you don't say, you know, I just don't like these round shapes. I'm going to make a square Porsche. It wouldn't be a Porsche. Um, it wouldn't make any sense at all. You just don't do that. So it has two advantages. It removes personal taste. It also gives everybody a leg up in the conversation because everybody knows what the vocabulary is. Everybody knows what it's supposed to look like. Let's get back to what, uh, how it works, which is more important than what it looks like. And more important than that, we were talking about this earlier, what does it mean? You know, what, is it, what, are we, what are we actually doing for our customers? How are they going to think about this, feel about it? You know, what's it mean to them? Um, and so we have, we have some work to do to get there. Um, but there's a lot of good work happening right now. Tens more cohesive uh, than I think some of the previous operating systems were. Um, there's still some aid in there, and there's still some fist in there, which is a little concerning. But we're moving in the right direction. Um, I would love if we just all collapsed on one visual style and we just didn't care anymore. Right? It just wasn't the priority. Um, now, we'd get better and better at it over time. We wouldn't just stop. Um, but we'd all be working on a, a cohesive body of work. That's one I feel pretty passionate about. So um, coming back to the point of uh, arts for kids, yes. I, I, um, I'm looking for some help. Like I need uh, some references about like how to methodically um, encourage a kid to, to do more arts. Because I myself, I, I do a lot of, because um, during the daytime I write quotes, but I, every day I do painting, uh, sketching, and all those things. I have a small room in my house where I do all sorts of things. Yeah. But I am completely confused about how to encourage my eight-year-old. And he doesn't want to uh, draw, doesn't want to sketch. And me or my wife, we are never uh, critical about what he does, like how he does. Yeah. Because I was taught by my sister, and I know that you should not criticize and all this, but like for example, my friend's daughter, like every day she draws like the tens of uh, different things, but I am failing to encourage my, my son. So there's some really interesting psychological stuff probably going on again. So I'm not a scientist. Um, <laughs> what else did I say I wasn't? <laughs> I'm not an educator and I'm not a psychologist. Um, uh, but the, the conventional wisdom is just uh, time and opportunity, right? That uh, if you, oh, and modeling. So the, the three things you normally do, you're already doing. Uh, you make sure that the resources are there everywhere. Um, and so that if that the moment the inspiration strikes, the tools are available. Uh, you model the behavior, uh, which you're already doing. Um, so I think the question would be, in modeling the behavior, uh, is are you getting eight years old male? Yeah. Are you already getting the, I don't know what I'm going to do, but it's not going to be what my dad does? Because um, that's somewhere around there. So some of it could be that, uh, which I can't help you with at all. Um, but most of the stuff you're already doing is right. That there should be. The, the behavior should be modeled. Everybody should be drawing in your household. Um, and the materials should be there. And, and then I guess you mostly have to be patient. Uh, baseball bats, too, they work sometimes. <laughs> and on that note, I think, oh, well, one more, yeah. No, I'm just interested in learning more about what your charter is and you know, the reason you came to Microsoft and what you see yourself doing like in the next year. Or oh, here at Microsoft? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so um, what can I talk about when I can't? Uh, I came here with a, 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 a narrow charter and a broad possibility. Uh, so the narrow charter um, was to help Julie Larson Green uh, in her role as CXO. Um, that might be a broad charter too. Uh, but uh, the, the short term is uh, they have a team uh, that's working on agent technology. And so I'm uh, supporting them or leading them, depending on how you look at it. Uh, I came here 
um, because uh, over the course of nine months of being worn down by various people, uh, I, finally it hit me that uh, somebody's going to build her. You know the movie, Her? Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Somebody's going to build that. I, and I know it wasn't going to be Adobe. Um, and I, it might be Apple, but I don't know if you know people who work there. Um, it's an interesting challenge. And it might be Google, but I don't like the commute. Uh, so Microsoft made sense. Uh, so that's, that's the glib answer. But I'm also, I've been uh, spending a lot of time uh, with uh, uh, executives like Satya and Chi who are trying to figure out how to make design uh, more impactful uh, here at Microsoft. So I'm either going to be part of the problem or part of the solution, uh, one of the two. So, yeah. Yes? Uh, I have a more uh, pragmatic question regarding the actual pen and stylus. I think a lot of what you said totally resonates with me in terms of uh, a lot of folks basically are either told or their inner inner critic tells them to stop drawing. And I think that's one of the primary reasons why the devices that are primarily focused on a stylus are not having a wide penetration in the market, yeah. right? Because it's, it's one of those things where like this is not essential for a majority of people while keyboard probably is, or a touch, let's argue either one. So, um, but given that we're so heavily betting in our devices, like Surface, we're so heavily betting on a differentiator as a pen and a high class device type of thing, now we're having some more competition, but um, I think the pushing the challenge, pushing this message of everybody should draw is actually a super important business decision yes. uh, for us to make. <laughs> uh, so, this company notoriously, then I'm going to get in trouble, but this company <laughs> notoriously have a, has a very hard uh, way of marketing um, and, and teaching consumers through marketing, like basically changing consumer mindset through marketing. Yes. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Like, How do we actually change that? Because I think if we succeed in even changing a few percent of that thing, that is not millions, that's billions of dollars, right? So. What, what's your thoughts on that? And what, how much can you share? Yeah, well, so uh, uh, let me uh, back up a little bit. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier that, uh, or was I talking to you then? I, it, most of the things that are breakthrough uh, operate at uh, the level of categories. So uh, our brains are all set up so that we categorize things. That's where prejudice comes from. Um, but it's also how we uh, know how to operate a door every time we see a door, right? Because they're broad category, they're doors, they open, we know it. Um, consumers have the same uh, kind of behavior. So there are broad categories like Nike, athleticism, Adobe, creativity. Uh, and we had this category that uh, we are now calling productivity. It used to be office, it used to be more, a little more straightforward. It was a certain category of work. Um, I mean, usually you had like a, a shirt with a collar and you, know, um, you sat all day. So we really owned that category. The, shirt with a collar, set all day. Um, and that category has been eroding. And so we have to figure out what the next category is. Uh, and it, it, I think it's still work, um, and that's kind of exciting. Um, but we haven't figured out how to describe it yet. Um, we haven't figured out how to uh, think about it internally enough that we can come up with a platform for explaining it externally. Um, so I wouldn't blame marketing for that. Um, because uh, if we just make a pile of stuff and we say, you know, help us sell this pile of stuff, uh, they're always going to have a hard time. And there's been a remarkable bag of doorknobs at Microsoft for a long, long time. There's been some points of cohesion, but there's also, it's just a broad, broad story. Quick editorial side comment. Everybody's rooting for us. I mean, if marketing, if we want right now uh, to take the world by storm, they'll let us. The Microsoft brand, uh, people just are hoping, right? They're just like, <laughs> do it. Come on. You know, wow us. And I think pen input could be a big part of that, um, getting more narrow now. Now, so we associate it with either creativity or drawing or just work. Um, but the work we haven't done yet is it doesn't friggin' do anything. So if you're gonna replace other input methods, it has to actually replace them. And we have to prove the value. So pen for uh, most kinds of recording, where that digital recording actually becomes useful, that's something we have to do now. And I know the OneNote team's all over it trying to figure it out. Pen for command, we have to do that. And then if we it turns out that that kinesthetic activity makes you more productive or a better worker, uh, then we'll definitely be on to something. Then we can go out and market that. Um, but we don't quite have it yet. So 
Now, the, the, I'm rambling now, but one of the things that marketing could do is talk about it externally and convince all of us to build it. That would be another approach. Um, uh, Steve Jobs was famous for that. Like the, it was out on the bus shelter, and everybody was going, like, we're building that? Uh, <laughs> so we, we could do that as well. Uh, you had a question in the back? Uh, so quickly, the point Can I, yeah, you, just one interruption. I, I know people have like real lives and stuff like that, so it, it's not, it, we're over time, so if you need to leave, please yeah, feel, <laughs> feel free with, with no embarrassment. But, but we're okay. There, so, okay. So maybe this will be the last question. Yeah. So combined point about uh, betting on the stylus and making it really useful, and your message about getting it to draw, uh, would you support a dog food program for the stylus across for the whole company to draw? It's a great idea. I mean, it's a really, really good idea. Um, I, the, the program that I, I did with the SLT around uh, creativity, I, we're looking for the next steps in that. And so that might be like a, a drawing program uh, across the company. It would be amazing. One of the things that convinced me to come here uh, was uh, a meeting I had about a year ago uh, with um, members of the SLT and then uh, the leadership team at my old company. And uh, for whatever reason, maybe this is still true, but uh, around the table, uh, Chi and Satya and I can't remember who all else was in that meeting, they all had the Surface Pro uh, threes and they were all handwriting all their notes. And I thought, I've come to heaven. I mean, I, this, is, this is a world where the pen rules. And so we should probably go ahead and just make it that. Um, it's a really good idea. Yeah. Yeah. What is your favorite device and software or app for digital art? Ah, I got in insane amount of trouble uh, for answering this question a few years ago. Um, because my, my old CEO found out, because uh, um, I said it was George's, um, God, what's the name of his product? Uh, crap. On the iPad, uh, yeah, uh, Paper by 53. Because that's, that's the courier team, right? So the, most of that innovation happened here. Um, love the product uh, because uh, the line is so right. Um, and the color work uh, is so simple. And the interface uh, is actually, uh, it just doesn't get in your way. Like you can be in flow. Uh, so of the drawing apps, um, there are some that are better. Uh, but uh, that was my favorite for quite a bit of time. Uh, the one that I worked on uh, is called Line. And I believe Adobe is about to discontinue it. Um, but the reason that I love that one, I use these for two different purposes, is it supports a digital ruler. So I drew as an architect, and I'm so used to being able to quickly draw the straight lines. And it has a physical version of that ruler, and then a, uh, you know, one that you can just just yeah. captures two points. Yeah. yeah, and I love drawing in that. That one's. Um, if I had to choose between the two, I think the paper one's still more useful, um, but the line one's more fun. So. Thanks, everybody. Okay, thank you all. This is pretty great. Thank you, Michael.